All right, everyone, welcome. Uh, I'm so glad that you're with us today. Uh, my name is Lance Marshall, as I mentioned earlier. This is The Gathering. It's a new service for new people here at the First United Methodist Church uh, of Fort Worth. We do things very casually here, but at the same time, uh, we go really deep, too. And I'm so thankful that you found us today. One of the things that we do here at The Gathering to kind of guide our time together is something that we call series. Series are sets of conversations. They can go a couple weeks or a couple months uh, on specific issues. Sometimes they're on books of the Bible, like a series we did on Revelation early in the year, helping to demystify it, debunk a lot of the misunderstandings of it that are in our culture at the same time, help it be something that actually influences your daily life. Uh, sometimes it's on, uh, you know, conversations like the relationship between science and faith. Uh, we did an entire series on that earlier in the year. Uh, if you ever want to catch up on anything you've heard about or missed here at the gathering, you can always do that through our Facebook or our YouTube page uh, or through our podcast. The name of our podcast is God Bless Y'all, because that saying makes me laugh. Um, and so you can always catch up on things like that. We're doing a series right now based on a set of conversations that I think are vital uh, they're important topics in our lives. They're the kind of things that we typically talk about with the people with whom we're the most comfortable, uh, that we have the most intimate relationships with, that we trust with our, you know, our real thoughts and feelings on life's most important issues. Uh, and that those are the topics of sex, death, and money. And so we talked about those um, for the last handful of weeks here, and specifically the ways in which the, 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 the Christian story, the Christian response, the Christian uh, discussion on these issues a lot of times tends to get really flattened. Uh, or, or made overly simple, you know, the, the, the Christian attitudes um, towards sex are actually much more positive uh, and much more life-affirming than we're often led to believe. Um, the Christian discussion around death is actually much more nuanced uh, and much more leveled than just, hey, don't worry about it, everything's going to be fine in the end. We actually do a lot better job of acknowledging how that process goes. And then at the same time, our conversations around money and faith so often can get just really stilted or one-dimensional or completely ignored. And so one of the things that I uh, want to do is, is spend an extensive amount of time talking on each one of those things. And we're, we're now getting close to the end of the series, and we're going to be focusing on our second conversation around um, money. So uh, I mentioned before, just as a quick heads up, in October, October 30th is the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses to the Wittenberg door. Um, and a, an act that started the Reformation and radically changed faith. And over the five weeks of October, we're going to be discussing the ways in which um, that moment dramatically changed your life, your faith, and your relationship with God, the things that that changed. You know, the fact that you read a Bible printed in English could not have happened if it wasn't for that moment. Uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg of the things that that changed for you. And so I can't wait to talk about it. We're going to wait till October to get going on that. So uh, talking about this series, um, I w I've been reflecting and thinking a lot about uh, the things that I really feel are important for me to talk about in my, uh, my ministry, right? My interaction with, I'm, I am really bad at a lot of things that pastors do, right? Not good at some of the visits, not good at some of the one-on-one -on -one stuff. Uh, the idea of teaching a class of sixth graders gives me a heart attack. Um, <laughs> in fact, the confirmation class, our sixth graders, a couple years ago, they had me come and speak because they were out of ideas. And uh, I was talking to these kids, and I was like 20 minutes in, and I was just getting nothing, like complete shutdown, no movement in the face. And at one point, I just stopped the talk, and I went, I will have you guys know, adults find me delightful. <laughs> <laughs> no response, right? Uh, <laughs> nothing. Um, I, I do feel like I have kind of a ministry of proclamation, though, a ministry of preaching and teaching and writing and kind of just sharing the Christian story with the world. And there's a couple of things I'm constantly thinking about over and over and over again, just a few meta themes. Uh, one of them are themes of uh, how to, you know, through the Christian story, through relationship with God, through Christ and the Holy Spirit, what it is to live a life that's actually worth living, right? There's a million cultural messages that try to tell you this is what life is all about and this is what will make you happy. And, and usually those are in service of things like breakfast cereal or exercise machines, right? Like there's a lot of times those messages you get won't actually help you lead a fulfilled life, a happy life, a life that's one with your creator that fulfills what it means to be alive here on the earth and to live the most of your potential. Uh, try to tell a story, right, that proclaims that to a world that's so desperate to hear it. I think over and over again about how to tell a story, how to help people understand how to have a life and a faith that can endure the deepest and the hardest of times, right? Remember, my own story involves having stage four cancer at 25, right? How do you maintain hope? How do you maintain uh, a feeling that God is good and present in your life in the midst of uh, you know, loss of family members and loss of hopes and dreams of financial difficulties of whatever, right? How do you maintain this hope and belief that God is good and God is active and God is present when everything is falling apart? I constantly think about how to share a message like that. And one of the last things I think about, and you may not 
we have caught on to this, but one of the things I think about all the time is how to talk to rich people about money. That's another one, too, right? Um, I really appreciate those of you who thought that was really funny. <laughs> There's a, and again, a, and a, good, uh, a good rule of thumb here is if you think I'm trying to make you laugh, I am. Um, just give me the benefit of the doubt. It doesn't get any better. So I'm thinking about those things over again. How do, how do you talk to rich people about money? Uh, and, and one of the reasons I do this is uh, because it's a part of my own story, right? It's a part of my own story. One of the things that's just stone cold true about my own life is that I grew up in a very fortunate family, right? I've, and I grew up in a community filled with the same kind of people, right? And so I've reflected over and over again on what it means to be in that kind of environment, how it shapes you, what it teaches you, how you teach those lessons to your children, the lessons you need to make sure your children don't learn by accident, right? How does this shape you and inform you? Uh, I've had to do a lot of deprogramming, to be honest, the things I picked up unintentionally through the world growing up in one of those kind of communities. I think a lot about how to talk to rich people about money. And one of the things I wanted just kind of to point out is that I had no idea that I grew up in a rich family until I left, right, until I moved out on my own. I had no idea that this was how the world was, or uh, uh, more specifically how it wasn't what the world was like for the vast majority of people, right? And I don't mean I had like a helicopter, y'all. I just mean, you know, like I got to play travel soccer. I got to go on a vacation every summer. Uh, I grew up in a, in a house where everyone had their own bedroom, plus there was a guest bedroom, you know, I, I got to grow up in a family like this, and every single one of my friends lived in a similar life, right? We just lived in a community where this was how things worked, and so I thought it was completely normal. And so I went to college and started paying my own bills, and I was like, this is not normal, <laughs> you know, uh, having to learn the vast difference. And so one of the things I think about all the time is how to talk to rich people about money. And one of the things I want to point out is a lot of times when we're talking about rich, uh, we immediately think the kind of people who have, like, TV shows on E!, or the kind of people who have like domestic staff, right? Or things along those lines. I mean, I think what's one of the things that would have been really helpful in my life is if my family had told us that we were rich, right? No one ever said that. I had to piece that together in my 20s, right? No one ever told us we were rich. And when I talk about rich, I want to put an actual a name on it. You know, so we live in uh, the United States of America. Well, you can write that down if you want. Um, <laughs> We live in the United States of America, right? The richest country that's ever lived, that's ever existed on the face of the planet. Uh, additionally, we live in the great state of Texas, uh, you know, the greatest state that God ever placed on any map. Uh, we live in Dallas-Fort Worth, by far the greatest metroplex in the greatest state of Texas. Am I right? We all, we all don't live... I love Houston jokes, and I can't. They're just taken away from me. Um, uh, you know, we live in one of the most fortunate s countries on the planet, in by far the best state, and one of the most fortunate regions, right? And but the most of us live in Tarrant County, right? That's where Fort Worth is located. Most of us live in Tarrant County. If you live in Dallas County, bless your heart. Um, <laughs> we live in uh, Tarrant County, Texas. And when you're trying to figure out, you know, relative wealth and how you fit into your community, it's important to think in terms of median, right? Not average. Averages are, are not helpful in this conversation. Myself and Bill Gates together have an average income of $30 billion, <laughs> right? It's not helpful when I'm applying for a loan, right? It's important to think about median, right? The median is the middle. Median is half the people have an income that's below this level, half the people have an income that's above, right? So if you are above the median income in Tarrant County, that means you are on the, the upper half of earners in one of the most affluent counties, in one of the most affluent regions, of one of the most affluent states, in the most affluent country that's ever existed on the face of the planet Earth, right? And that median income per household, in, uh, based on the last census in Tarrant County, is $60,700 annually. So if you are on this side of the line, you are of the wealthier half of the wealthiest county, of one of the wealthiest regions, of the wealthiest state, and the wealthiest country that's ever existed on the face of the planet, right? That's what I'm calling rich. Uh, the Bible has a lot to say about people who live in this region, right? And that community is extremely well represented in our church. A huge percentage of our church is currently experiencing homelessness or poverty or has experienced homelessness or poverty at some portion of their life or has lived very comfortably and very honorably below this level for the entirety of their lives, right? That's very well represented in this incredibly diverse church. At the same time, 
uh, the majority of the addresses that are listed in our membership base come from zip codes that live beyond this number, right? And, uh, and I have lived, every single moment of my childhood was lived in this section, right? Every community that I've ever lived in lived in this section. Uh, even now, based on, the, even though my wife and I both live in full-time vocational ministry in the church, based on our education opportunities, we'll live the entirety of our adult lives probably in that section too, right? I'm calling that rich, and I'm celebrating it, right? I want to lift it up. I want to acknowledge it. There is, nothing, there is nothing special or beautiful about being poor, right? This is actually in so many ways a blessing, a gift, something to be thankful for, something to be appreciative of, but at the same time, it's also something that we need to acknowledge, right? I had no idea that I grew up in not only this portion of the map, but even farther away from it, right? I grew up in a significant portion of it. We need us to talk about it if we're going to be honestly discussing who we are in our relationship with ourselves and our families and our communities and God. It's something we need to acknowledge. And so one of the things I'm going to list today is where we go from here, right? And we specifically are going to be talking about things that apply to everybody, regardless of where you fit on this line. But at the same time, I've, I've always wanted to do a sermon. I'm talking to the rich folks, right? And in this conversation, that's anybody who has a household that's a combined income of over this number or lives by themselves and is over half of that number, right? That's the rich folks. I want to talk about what it is to be rich in the world, right? To be one of the few people in the vast uh, history of the world who actually gets to live in this community. And what then do you do with your relationship with God? What then do you do with your relationship with yourself and with finances? What then do you do with who you are and who God has called you to be? All right? So, and I specifically uh, want to point out that this is an us conversation, not a them conversation, right? I'm, I've been in that portion of the, the timeline for my entire life, and so this is a conversation that includes us. So, there's a letter in the Bible that we're going to be reading. It's, uh, it's called First Timothy. It's way toward the back. Uh, if you pull up the, uh, the, the number, if you have your red, if you brought, um, if you got one of the Bibles off the back, it's going to be in page 908. It's only a page or so long, so it's hard to find by the flip method. First Timothy is a really interesting book of the Bible. It's a letter, of course. It's an epistle, which means it was written from someone to someone about something. Uh, specifically, it says it was written by Paul. It's probably not. In the ancient Near East, it was actually considered an honorable thing to, uh, to write a letter and then say it was written by someone who really inspired you or taught you. So that's, me, like, that's like me writing an email and saying, this is from Tim Brewster, right? That was acceptable in 2017. I've been informed it's not acceptable today. Uh, <laughs> That's a joke, <laughs> right? That was very acceptable. So it's pseudopigraphic. It's probably not actually written by Paul. We, we can tell that based on the language and the focuses and things like that. First Timothy is an interesting letter because it's written from a church leader to a young preacher, right, who's going out into the world to speak and to teach. Uh, in a lot of ways, it reflects some of the biases of the author. It talks about women and slaves in ways that are not cool in 2017, but were cool then. Uh, so it's got some of these, these uh, contextual issues that we have to honestly wrestle with. And at the same time, it speaks to a lot of timeless issues, right? And one of the things that uh, this older preacher and teacher and leader is writing to this younger preacher and teacher and leader, Lance, I mean Timothy, is, you know, directions he needs to bring to the community, right? In First Timothy 6, the very last end of the letter, right? This is what he, the letter is not done until he mentions this, right? This is his big farewell, Uh, this is his final message to him before he gives his sign off. This is the last bit he has. He's talked for a lot about what it is to teach people how to live faithfully, how to have the right relationship with their money, their finances, etc. This is the last bit he has. Chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. The writer says this, Timothy, tell people who are rich at this time, at this time, like who are rich now, not to become egotistical and not to place their hope on their finances, which are uncertain. Instead, they need to hope in God, who richly provides everything for our enjoyment. Tell them to do good, to be rich in the good things they do, to be generous, and to share with others. When they do these things, they will save a treasure for themselves that is a good foundation for the future. That way, they can take hold of what is truly life. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. Thanks be to God right? We have this message from this older preacher to this younger preacher who's going to go out and preach and teach and lead communities. Tell the people who are rich now, right, who are enjoying the benefits of wealth and money now, tell them this, right? Tell them how to live in right relationship with that money. Tell them how to use that money for the benefit of their families and for their communities, and tell them what to really keep their focus on, 
right? So they can enjoy the fullness and richness of life lived with God. Teach them that. Well, okay. So we're going to be talking today on lessons of how to do that, right? I mean, those things are, those are good end goals, right? This right relationship, uh, this right understanding, how to live, how to have your money in your life, particularly if you're a rich person, uh, live in harmony and well together. Uh, those are really good end goals, but how do you actually do it, right? What are some actual things that you could put on your refrigerator door, right? What are the actual things that you could tell, that you could talk about in your family, that you could teach your kids, that you could tell to the people that you love uh, in your life? What are actionable steps to doing this? right, so that you can actually have what is truly life. What are some actionable steps? So I'm going to give you three steps, uh, and then particularly I want you to think about them in two ways. Um, each one of them will have um, a practical element to it, you know, what it means, what it does, and each one of them will have a theological element, meaning this is what it says about God, right? This is what this, pra- this, is what this um, actually says about the God that you worship, the God that you serve, the God that you live in a relationship with. So for those of you who are new to the whole, the whole Methodist thing, which is how we talk about it, um, <laughs> eh, really hit. Um, for those of you who are new to the whole Methodist thing, uh, we, were, we started as an offshoot of um, the Church of England, uh, not because we really had any major disagreements, we just had this really charismatic preacher and leader in the Church of England named uh, John Wesley in the 1700s, uh, Johnny Dubbs, and he did a lot of thinking and writing and teaching uh, he was just great and just really created communities of people who were really on fire for Jesus and, and loved having it transform their lives and transform the lives of others in their communities. Uh, and the followers were really good at, you know, Excel spreadsheets, the 1700 versions, and so they got called Methodists. And then a little bit later, there was a, there was a, re- a revolutionary war, and we looked up, we were our own church, right? But that's kind of the history of our founding. And uh, even now, a couple hundred years later, um, the Methodist churches, there's more than just the United Methodists, but we're the, the largest, uh, we're always looking back to Johnny Dubbs and his teaching and his writings uh, and ways. In one of his most famous sermons um, is something called The Use of Money. The Use of Money that he wrote in the 1700s. It's a, it's a beautiful sermon. Uh, and, and in it, he outlines, you know, how to actually live faithfully with money, particularly uh, for all people, but particularly if you're one of the people who inhabits this portion of the line, right? How to live faithfully in regards to money. And so for young preachers 250 years later, uh, we get to use this as a guideline, right? So what we're going to be talking about today is how to actually honor uh, those lessons learned in 1 Timothy, to how to actually follow Jesus and all of his teachings about money uh, in some way that we can actually, you know, follow in our regular lives, put on our refrigerator door, etc. Sound good? First one, earn all you can. That's the first line from Johnny Doe. John Wesley. <laughs> I need to get out of that habit um, before the bishop comes. Johnny Dubs. Um, <laughs> right? The first lesson from John Wesley is earn all you can. Does that surprise you? Coming from the theological, like, you know, progenitor of our, of our tradition, right? Have you ever heard the church say that? Y'all, earn all you can. Earn all you can. Right? Think about that. This is my letter. You know, as your pastoral leader, Lance, what do I do? How, do? how do I follow God's call in my life? What are some of the ways I can do? One, it is a good and faithful thing to be thinking over and over yourself, to say to each other and to your kids, earn all you can. Right? Earn what you can. And the practical aspect behind that, what that's really saying is use your gifts. Use your gifts in the world. Right? Create value. In fact, my bad, this is supposed to go over here. Um, I'm not using notes, y'all. Uh, what I want you to do is when you're earning, when you're making money, when you're doing so, I want you to actually create value in the world, right? That's the whole idea of what you get, that's what you get paid for. You're creating value. You're doing a service that helps a company meet its goals and take care of its customers, right? You are adding value by helping a company protect its intellectual property or its resources or its capital through your legal work. You're creating value because you're teaching a young child, and that young child is going to be able to grow up and have self-actualization and build something and create for their family. You're creating value because you're keeping the building clean where all of those things can happen, right? You're creating value in that work. You are helping people find homes that they can live in and do so in a way that where their interests are represented. You are creating value in this world. Do everything you can to create value, right? And one of the key things that uh, we have done with the invention of this capitalist system, which isn't perfect, 
and we'll continue to revise it for the hundreds of years going into the future, but it has created more value for the world that has led more people out of poverty, that has led more people into having full stomachs and safe places to live, right? Create value in the world. That is good. That is holy, right? God's great vision for this world is everyone with a safe place to live, everyone with enough food on the table, right? Everyone with the ability to exercise who God made them to be, right? Create the value that helps that come to be. Celebrate your gifts, right? And the theological statement of that is that God gave you gifts. God made you you. God gave you abilities, right? Exercise them. Exercising them is well and good and beautiful. Earn all you can, right? From J-Dubs himself. You can say anything in a Methodist sermon. If, J- if John Wesley said it, you're in. <laughs> Earn all you can. Two, he said this. Save all you can. We were off to a good start. <laughs> Save all you can. One of the things that uh, John Wesley is constantly talking about is your heart, your spirit, your life and your relationship with God, right? One of the things that I learned growing up in one of these communities, and one of the things that I know I'm going to need to do a better job teaching my son, is that sometimes, when you grow up in these communities, you can fall into the trap of believing that that next thing is what will make you happy, right? That next toy that next Nerf gun, that next whatever is the thing that will make you happy. And what's the adult version of that, right? The next blank, that will make you happy, right? The next whatever, that's the thing that will make you happy. Saving all you can is a constant renegotiation of wants versus needs. Remember my, uh, my personal example Last week, driving out to West Texas and seeing those Suburbans, just imagining myself with a cowboy hat on as I drove. That's, the, that's a minister in Fort Worth, right? Look at me, driving a car I can't even wear a cowboy hat in. What a disgrace, right? And so quickly, my language went from want to, well, you know what? I mean, I, I need a Suburban, <laughs> right? Uh, so quick, the constant negotiation of want versus need, right? One of the things that Wesley talks about in the use of money over and over and over again. And this is going to scandalize the parents out there, and this is going to give the grandparents a heart attack. <laughs> One of the things that we are worst about is overgiving to kids. Right? There were some mm-hmms in here. <laughs> there was, I started, oh man, we heard, I, I got an amen out of this crowd. <laughs> One of the things we are the worst about is overgiving to kids. Right? Let me say this. There's going to be a moment. I want to encourage you to have this moment. I want to encourage you to have this moment with a child that you love, right? Aunt, uh, niece, nephew, grandbaby, baby. I want you to have a moment. You don't have to say this out loud to them, but I want you to have this moment. I want there to be something that they ask for, right? And in your head, you know, one, you would absolutely love and appreciate and use this thing. And two, I absolutely can afford it, right? And you will not be getting it. Because part of me raising you, part of me supporting you, part of me teaching you in the world is teaching you that the happiness in life, the source of your joy, is not just constantly hitting the pellet for a new acquisition, right? And if I raise you up as a child like this, you will die as an adult because of those lessons you learn, right? One of the things you will have to do in raising up that child that you love is to let them have that moment, and it's hard on you, but it's necessary, right? Save all you can. The theological statement about this is that it's not just about you, right? The promise isn't your own cloud in heaven. We're in this together, right? These resources are ours together. One of the things that we've learned in our generation, right, this was not apparent to all the generations that came before us, and it is now apparent in our generation. It is possible for us to consume the resources of the planet just for our own wants to the point where other communities don't have enough for what they need. It's just true, 
we can overconsume to fulfill our own wants to the point where other communities don't have access to what they need. It's true. Last thing. Earn all you can. Save all you can. Give all you can. One of the things I promised you last week when I talk about money in church, 80% of the time, I'm not talking about giving to the church. I'm not talking about the church's operating budget. I'm talking about your relationship with money in general, right? And particularly uh, how it stands is your relationship with God. Um, when we are talking about fundraising and money in the church, I'll let you know. So when I'm saying give all you can, right, this does not turn around to me passing a pledge card, right? Give all you can is a stance. Give all you can is an attitude between you and God, right? Giving all you can is the understanding that when Jesus shows up in the gospel of Mark and his first proclamation to the world is change your, the kingdom of God is at hand, change your hearts and lives and believe this good news, right? The very first proclamation made by Jesus to the crowds that are listening, the kingdom of God is at hand, change your hearts and lives and believe in this good news. That's the call that's the work. That's the offer. That's what we're up to. Give all you can is your way of saying, I will be a part of it, right? I am going to be a part of what God is doing in this world. I am going to be a part of the coming of God's kingdom. God's kingdom come looks like children having enough food in their bellies, a family that loves them, and a safe place to sleep. God's kingdom come looks like everyone having the opportunity to exercise the gifts that God gave them. God's kingdom come looks like the least and the last and the lost having a place that welcomes them and accepts them. God's kingdom come looks like every single person on the planet feeling safe and secure. God's kingdom come looks like devastation and destruction being turned into happy, healthy homes. That is what God's kingdom come looks like. And give all you can means I am going to be a part of that. I have a part to play in that. I have a role in that. Practically, that looks like you supporting kingdom work in the world wherever you see it. Do you see it in your neighborhood? Do you see it in your family? Do you see it in your corporate work? Do you see it in education work? Support kingdom work. Support what God is doing in the world. Support the green shoots breaking through of the concrete. Support hope where there was hopelessness. Support peace where there was war. Support being full and satisfied where there was hunger and want. Support it. Be a part of it. Help it come to fruition. That is what God is calling you to do. That is who God made you to be. Give all you can. And the theological statement behind that is God works through us over and over and over again. We are the people of God. We are the hands and the feet of Christ. We are the workers for his world and for his kingdom. And one of us who are fortunate enough to live so much of our life in here, whether it's very close or very far from that number, we have a role to play. The blessings to do it and the opportunity in front of us over and over and over again. And it is good news to be celebrated. Being in that place is a blessing. Being given the gifts and the abilities to be one of the few people who've ever walked the face of the planet to live on this side of the timeline is amazing, and we give thanks for it over and over and over again. God bless that opportunity. Thank you for it. And we've got work to do and the opportunity to do it. And that's good news. Let's pray. God, on behalf of every single person in this room, I give you thanks. I give you thanks for our gifts. I give you thanks for our opportunities. I give you thanks for our resources. I give you thanks for the communities that you've placed us in. I give you thanks for the example that you set for us. I give you thanks for this good news, this opportunity of a world that is changing and a chance to be a part of it, oh God. I give you thanks for the people in this room who use those resources over and over again for your kingdom work, for the feeding of those who are hungry, for the sheltering of those who are exposed, for the safety of those who are in danger, for the education of those who might live a better life. God, I give you thanks for trusting us, for being with us, and for being, br bringing us along in your transforming work of this world. God, we've got all we need.
thanks to you. It's together that we follow the example of your son, Jesus Christ, loving as he loved, healing as he healed, serving as he served, and saying together the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.